Please be seated. A few years ago, when I was first starting to preach as a college chaplain, I was given the following advice. Always ask yourself, what's the good news here? That frame is helpful to me as we walk together through this especially tricky story, this parable. But I do think that we only get to the good news this morning through some bad news first. Jesus talks a lot about money. The Gospels are full of warnings about wealth, possessions, and the burdens they create. In our passage today, Jesus is speaking within earshot of the Pharisees, but he directs the story and the following warnings to his disciples, the people who were already following him. And yet, as a whole, the culture of Christianity we have today often pushes these sayings and parables and warnings to the side in favor of other topics that people of many backgrounds and political stripes have agreed to identify as Christian issues. This difficult and strange and confusing story about money, followed by hard and even ambiguous sayings about wealth, prompts me to consider how much I hold the material realities about my life, how I spend and think about my resources, and whose I believe them to be, up to the purposes of God. Do I consider them to be part of my life in faith, or do I hold them separately somehow, placing them in neat compartments? So bad news, if Jesus cares so much about money, I think we as a community of believers have some work to do. But the good news, parables are meant to disorient us, even shock us, and teach us things that we wouldn't learn in plain language or simple directives. Things that are more complicated, maybe, than simple do's or don'ts. And we have a whole faith that's based around a person, a figure, a life, not simply a text or a list of rules. And Jesus' parables mirror that reality of our faith. So it's appropriate that we resist that urge to look for a simple answer. We meet them expecting complexity, maybe expecting to see ourselves in multiple characters in them and meeting God in startling twists. It's not clear in this passage where Jesus' story ends and where his response to the story begins. And as I found out, it's not clear, even to scholars that study this intensely, what the manager's dishonest actions actually were. Was he cheating the master to ingratiate himself? Or was he actually forgiving the debtors interest that they might have paid? Or maybe the cut that he would typically take from those transactions? And there's so many confusing, sometimes contradictory details here that can send us down those roads that tempt us to try and just figure it out. So if we're not going to do that this morning together, what can we do? Taking all of it in, where can we find the good news about following Jesus, about who God might be? The manager's trouble begins with the way that he handled possessions that didn't belong to him, but belonged to the rich man. And the crisis hits when the rich man discovers those actions, but allows this time in between that moment and later judgment or accounting or firing. And attempting to save his own future, <coughs> the manager turns and puts that wealth that he's been stewarding in service to relationships. When we listen closely, we realize that the manager doesn't receive any financial gain from that wheeling and dealing. He isn't running around, stealing money, putting it away so he can support himself after he maybe gets fired. Instead, his goal is that 
When I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. He's praised not for that misuse of another's resources, but for shrewdness. The manager, for all that dishonesty and squandering, knows that his salvation will be in relationships, in a community web. His response acknowledges that connection between resources and relationships that sometimes we, even as people of faith and followers of Christ, lose. It's the returning to or establishing relationships that the rich man observes and praises, and then Jesus himself praises. And then the really startling twist in the parable today is the master's praise itself, Jesus' praise of that behavior. I think for so many of us, myself included, that longing for an expectation of justice means some sort of retribution. It means us imagining God exacting revenge of some kind on the people we believe have been unfair or unjust. And that fantasy could make us hard to hear or read a parable like this one and search for where God is in the story. Shocked to imagine some aspect of God in a rich man complimenting his dishonest employee. Without pretending that I know what God is or isn't going to do, um, or that I can see into the kingdom beyond us, I want to gently challenge that instinct in myself. What if God is in fact as forgiving, as loving, as desiring of healing us and closing that distance between God and ourselves as we proclaim God to be? A God who calls us to account for ourselves and our lives and gives us the time and space to pull it together. A God who hears all of these places that we've fallen short and failed and maybe laughs, praising these all too human efforts at finding salvation in connectedness and relationship. A God who not only forgives our sins, but forgives our debts. What if God is in fact as forgiving as loving we proclaim God to be. That would be good news indeed. <laughs>